Thanks to Molly for putting together such a great meeting. Uh, thanks to all of you for being such wonderful company so far. Thanks in advance for hopefully not falling asleep um, after that lovely lunch. I'll try and keep you entertained. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about baboons um, in the context of uh, admixture and hybridization. So continuing on a, th a theme that has already been very nicely um, established this morning. Of course, there's longstanding interest in admixture and hybridization because of the way that it can change the distribution of genetic variation within populations, including potentially bringing in um, new adaptively um, important variation into the recipient population. And of course, uh, the idea is that by understanding the process of hybridization, we may also understand something about how uh, incipient species are formed. Um, for people in uh, anthropology departments like myself, though, um, a lot of the recent interest in hybridization has clearly been motivated by new findings coming out of ancient DNA research um, about the evolution of our own species and our close relatives, as shown here, where we now know uh, from a series of really remarkable analyses that our own lineage has been affected by um, repeated admixture with other now extinct archaic hominins, um, most notably the Neanderthal and Denisovans, and they form something of a tangled tree. Um, the genomic work on hybridization is much more advanced in, um, in the human lineage than it is for any other primate. But of course, one of the, the difficulties of dealing with um, hybridization with species that are now, or taxa that are now extinct, is that it's impossible to um, uh, get any sort of direct information on the causes of hybridization itself, that is the behavioral patterns that determine who moves where and who mates when they get there, as well as the immediate phenotypic consequences of those events um, thereafter. Fortunately, um, uh, the human lineage is not particularly unique among primates in, uh, in being engaged in repeated admixture. So this is from a review that I put together um, a few years ago, looking at all of the uh, primate species listed in um, the Perlman et al. 2011 tree. It's a little out of date. And asking about whether there was um, uh, a record in the scientific literature about whether each of those species engaged in natural hybridization in, in the wild. And as you'll see, 30% um, uh, or more of primate species in some particular group major groups of, of primates do, in fact, engage in um, naturally occurring hybridization. Um, the apes are, are quite high uh, in large part because of, um, of admixture among the gibbons. OK, so all of these are living species, meaning that we can use them as living models for understanding the processes and consequences of hybridization in primates. And of the primate species, probably the ones that are best studied, at least in the context of hybridization, are the wild baboons. So uh, the genus Papio, which currently consists of six different um, species distributed across most of sub-Saharan Africa, and in one case into Arabia. So I'm showing you here the distribution of those six extant species with three particular particular spots on that map highlighted by squares. Those are, uh, those are active hybrid zones between um, the adjoining uh, baboon species that have been studied as part of long-term individually centered um, field studies for, in some cases, um, uh, close to five decades. Okay, so the yellow site, that's where I work, and that's where this picture is from. That is the field site of the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, which uh, is located right on the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania to the south. I'm fortunate enough to co-direct this project with um, Susan Alberts, who's also at Duke, Jean Altman at Princeton, and Beth Archie at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, the Ambicelli population is distinguished uh, in particular because this is a longitudinal study of known individuals, so individuals who are recognized on site, about 300 at any given time, that's been ongoing since 1971. So we're now in our 48th year of data collection where data is being collected on a near daily basis. So what I mean by that is those individually recognized animals are being monitored almost every day and have been since 1971. We're now just breaking into our ninth generation um, of, of this population. Uh, when they are monitored, we, uh, we collect detailed behavioral data, demographic data, ecological data, and more recently um, complement those data sets with information on um, steroid hormone physiology, uh, microbiome variation, uh, parasitology, and genetics. With respect to my talk today, they're of interest because, as I say here, we, we call them yellow baboons. And when they were first scouted in the 1960s by Jean and Stuart Altman, who were looking for a good place to study baboons in Kenya, they documented them as a population of unadmixed yellow baboons. 
1982, they witnessed the immigration of the first um, uh, Anubis baboon or olive baboon into the population, followed by successful recruitment into one of our study groups and production of offspring. They published this paper a few uh, years after in 1986. So to give you an idea of what these guys look like, um, on the top left here is an individual that we have good reason to believe is an unadmixed Anubis baboon um, from uh, the central part of Kenya near Lake Nakuru. On the right side, a yellow baboon male, these are all males, um, uh, further to the east of Ambasali and Savo National Park. And on the bottom left, the animals that we had always considered to be yellow baboons in Ambasali. On the right hand side is a hybrid who was born in Ambasali, that's Dubu. In fact, we think he's probably um, an F2 back cross to uh, Anubis, so about 75% Anubis ancestry, 25% yellow. When I was a graduate student, I took the microsatellite data available for the population at the time and did the first uh, genetic estimates of what the composition of the population might look like, which looks, looked approximately at that time like this. So on the bottom is a genetic hybrid score, the proportion of the genome inferred to be of Anubis ancestry. And on the y-axis, it just shows you the cumulative proportion of the population. So consistent with Gene and Stewart's observations in the 70s, by this time, where we were now in the, the mid-2000s, the vast majority of the population did in fact look like yellow baboons, but we estimated that maybe a quarter to a third of the population had experienced recent intergression from Anubis immigrants or hybrid immigrants who carried both ancestry. Okay. So um, this is a field study. We were able to ask what this meant for the organisms themselves. Was this, in fact, predictive of any kind of interesting phenotypic variation in this population? So using that sort of very coarse scale, which had fairly large um, error bars around it, we were able to show that more Anubis-like animals in Ambicelli matured earlier, that is females with more Anubis ancestry experienced menarche earlier, and males experienced earlier testicular enlargement. And males in particular, which are the dispersing sex in, this, in both Anubis and yellow baboons, dispersed um, up to a year earlier than their more yellow-like um, uh, uh, group mates. So that's quite a, quite a large difference in the context of lifespans that might only go a, a few decades. Additionally, more Anubis-like males were more successful at obtaining concertships. So this is also referred to as mate guarding for a lot of species. And these are events in which uh, reproductive males closely associate with females who are undergoing estrus. And it's the context in which most conceptive events actually take place. Okay. Um, Anubis baboon males tend to be less affected um, in agonistic, that is competitive interactions than yellow baboon males by the most recent contest they experienced. So they experience smaller winner and loser effects. In addition, uh, more Anubis-like females and more Anubis-like males tend to be more likely to form close uh, affiliative intersexual uh, bonds with one another. And this happens to be a trait that is highly predictive of survival in, in the Ambicelli population. So in particular, uh, this trait and the, uh, and the observations we made for concertship suggest that there may be actual selective advantages to carrying Anubis ancestry in the Ambicelli population. All of these things were things that we, we suspect explain why there was such a rapid expansion of um, recent hybrids in our population over the course of just a few decades. I will note that for the social bond results and for the concertship results, we also were able to detect a signature of assortativity by ancestry. So Anubis-like males and Anubis-like females are more likely to form concertships. Yellow-like males and yellow-like females are more likely to um, form concertships. But this is a relatively small effect compared to other things that determine mating behavior in this population, particularly dominance rank in males. Okay. Um, so none of those things, potentially with the exception of the assortative mating and assortative social bond patterns, explain why if you were to cross a transect along southern Kenya, right across where the hybrid zone is currently located, you very rapidly transition between populations that look very Anubis through the hybrid zone to populations that look very yellow, um, which is something that's been supported by some genetic analysis of samples collected on the hybrid zone as well. Um, a few years ago, we started doing whole genome sequencing for this population and also for unadmixed populations as references, which um, showed us, as we suspected, that um, the hybrid individuals that we identified in hybrids do look genetically intermediate between animals that are unadmixed Anubis and unadmixed yellow. In addition, um, if we looked at the estimated yellow ancestry from the genome resequencing data and matched that to our a priori estimates of ancestry based on what we know about the pedigrees of individuals in our sample, they actually correlate pretty well. And you can see that on the bottom graph here. 
However, what was surprising to us is that individuals that we assumed were 100% yellow because they had no hybrid or Anubis ancestors, um, at least in the past several generations, were actually estimated based on the genomic data to only be about 80% yellow. And what you'll note in that PCA plot on the top, the Ambicelli animals are in little triangles. Yellow baboons in Ambicelli are actually a bit shifted towards an Anubis ancestry relative to yellow animals that we sampled from the middle of Tanzania, which, are, which is not close to the hybrid zone at all. In other words, what it looks like is that even those individuals that we believe to be unadmixed yellow in Ambicelli starting from the 60s and who went through this um, recent bout of, uh, of admixture um, subsequently in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s are all hybrids. They're all hybrids. And in fact, um, uh, for Ambicelli yellows in our population, they tend to carry about 15 to 20% what we estimate to be Anubis ancestry. OK, so what I've told you so far is that we were actually sort of interpolating between field observations and genetic and genomic analysis to put together a picture where we see in the onset of recent um, hybridization in Ambicelli in the 80s, a fast expansion of individuals who carry Anubis ancestry throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, probably uh, abetted in part by those observations that show faster maturation and advantages to, um, to mating, especially for males. And we are able to add genomic data to show that there's actually a much more complex history of admixture going on between Anubis baboons and yellow baboons in East Africa, um, just beyond when we were able to actually observe it uh, in person. And this sort of historical admixture between yellow and Anubis baboons is also, has also been recently supported by the Baboon uh, Genome Consortium, um, which identified historical admixture in Anubis baboons further north in Kenya. OK. So um, it took a, a number of years, but I finally got some graduate students who were interested in looking at the hybrids. And so um, these two students of mine, R.L. Fogel and Taras Vilgelis, were interested in expanding to, to use more of a genomic approach to um, to, uh, to, to ask about patterns of admixture in Ambicelli. So I'm just going to fast forward here. Um, we now have 300 plus full genomes resequenced from known individuals in our population. And we've called, instead of global estimates of ancestry, we've identified local patterns of ancestry across the genome of, of these individuals. And I'm just showing you a snapshot of that here. So every row here is a different individual, going from the most globally Anubis-like animals on the bottom to the most globally yellow-like animals on the top. This is just 100 megabases of chromosome 12. And the, um, the, those horizontal tracks are colored by ancestry. So you can see here that um, particular individuals switch as expected between regions where they're homozygous Anubis to heterozygous to homozygous yellow and, and so on. And so one of the questions, uh, oh, sorry, and I'll just point out what that looks like for our recent hybrids on, and our historical hybrids. So Eclipse is an animal who um, has recent Anubis and Anubis hybrids in her known pedigree. Rangi is an animal that we have no knowledge of any recent um, recent ancestors who were hybrids, but she clearly has Anubis baboon material in her genome as well. So we see this sort of mosaic pattern both within the individuals and across individuals in our population now, and that's what it looks like. Um, OK, so one of the natural questions is to ask across the genome why some regions of the genome seem to have a lot of Anubis ancestry in our population and some do not. And one potential guideline to uh, understanding patterns of variable integration across the genome comes from a paper that, um, of course, a number of you were involved in published recently that argues that selection against deleterious variants, integress deleterious variants, interacts with the recombination landscape to shape the amount of ancestry you might expect at different loci in the genome. And of course, of course, the intuition for this is simply that in regions of high recombination, um, those deleterious variants can be weeded out without weeding out an entire block of, of intergressed genome from the, from the intergressing animal, from the Anubis animals in this case. Um, we reason that should be true for the historical admixture in our population, which we roughly estimate um, may have happened um, maybe hundreds of generations in the past, but that we should not see any sort of signature of that um, among the animals who uh, were recently admixed in the last you know, three to five generations. Additionally, we hypothesize that we might see a difference in this pattern between regions of the genome that can contain functional variants that are, that, are, that are quite distinct, that have quite distinct effects on gene regulation between um, Anubis and yellow baboons, that is, regions that have large effect size might be more affected by this pattern than regions that have small effect size. Okay, so just to um, show you um, 
our version of what um, Molly and Molly showed in their paper. So that's the relationship between recombination rate quantile for windows of the genome and minor parent ancestry in sword tails um, based on uh, Neanderthal uh, uh, introgression into modern humans and based on Denisovan uh, introgression. And this is what it looks like in, in the baboons across all individuals. So this is a window size of about 100 uh, KB, and we see a correlation between uh, minor parent ancestry, Anubis ancestry, and recombination rate of about 0.08, so on the lower end of what was reported in Molly's paper. Um, Molly asked me what it looks like with larger window sizes, so we did that yesterday, and in fact it goes up to about 0.165, which is probably in part a consequence of the fact that we're using an Anubis-based recombination map here, which is what, ava what was available to us, and not a yellow baboon map, which of course is the dominant ancestry in this population. If we stratify chromosomes by whether they are affected by historical ancestry only or by historic, well, historical ancestry primarily versus uh, recent ancestry, then we see a distinction between the pattern that we see for historical ancestry as expected, it's a bit stronger than we look at when we look at everything together, versus recent ancestry where as expected we see no relationship between recombination rate and minor parent ancestry, presumably because there has been no selective sieve at that point. Okay. Um, this just breaks it down by Rongi and Eclipse, those two animals I showed you earlier, um, by recombination rate quantiles for chromosomes that look like them. Okay, so what does this look like uh, for functional data? We combine our resequencing data with RNA-seq data that have been generated for um, uh, a number of individuals in our population. We find substantial evidence for local ancestry effects on gene expression in our population, about 1,000 genes, where there's a correlation between gene expression and whether individuals are homozygous yellow heterozygous or homozygous anubis at that particular tract. And we see a similar effect if we look at DNA methylation for about 35,000 sites across the genome that have local ancestry effects, and these are related related to one another. Okay, so does that um, effect on gene regulation have any bearing on which regions of the genome are more introgressed versus others? Um, I think it's pretty equivocal at this point. So here I'm just breaking them out between windows that contain relatively few ancestry effects on DNA methylation versus those that have relatively more based on magnitude actually. And maybe there's a slightly stronger relationship in those windows con that contain relatively more. But this is a, a, a very preliminary analysis that we need to get into in a little bit more detail. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at two primates that are in fact not actually sister species, but that diverged about 1.4 million years ago. We see evidence from the field data that there are a number of sort of phenotypic traits that might lead to faster introgression of Anubis alleles into the population, and some evidence for assortative behavior that might, to some degree, resist that, um, that entry of Anubis alleles. What I find um, really interesting about adding this perspective on uh, recombination rate is that it suggests to us for the first time, we actually have no evidence from any phenotypic data that we've looked at, that there may in fact be barriers to introgression that we simply haven't been able to detect in the field data itself, which in itself sort of inspires us to go back to our field data and ask whether there are things that we're missing. We certainly haven't exhaustively looked at phenotypes in this population. One of the potentially um, Better candidates are differences in resistance to heat stress, which we know affects conception probabilities in this population. And Anubis baboons, as you can see on the left, are considerably darker than yellow baboons. So we're, at, we're out there looking at this now, and um, we don't have an answer. But hopefully I'll be able to tell you about it sometime in the future. So this was work that was led by Taris and Ariel, uh, my graduate students. I'm not looking for postdocs right now, but my student Taria, Taris is looking for a postdoc for those of you who are um, in the market for one. So thanks for your attention. Thank you.